I'm going to talk about um, what I'm calling out of context reasoning. And this is the ability to produce conclusions that have a logical or linguistic form without chain of thought reasoning. And um, I'm going to motivate why this matters for safety. So why empirical, this, the empirical questions around out of context reasoning um, have implications for AI safety and for scaling. Um, then I'm going to actually talk about some empirical results. So on out of context reasoning and scaling and then out of context reasoning and how it relates to reward hacking or the hacking of an objective and misalignment. Okay, so in this slide, I'm just gonna try and explain out of context reasoning. So this is a very important slide for the rest of the talk. So on the left hand side, um, you see I'm contrasting out of context reasoning with in context reasoning, which everyone will be familiar with. So in this left hand side, in yellow, we've got a context window. And in bold, the text at the top, that's the prompt for a context window. And then in this context window, there are three premises. There are two premises. A implies B and A. And then we've got a question, right? The prompt is B true. And then we've got an example of chain of thought reasoning where the model does this very trivial reasoning, okay? Which is just applying like the basic logical rule of modus ponens, right, to derive that B is true. So this is an example of in-context reasoning that GPT-4 for example, can like do very easily. And I've written this with like abstract uh, variables like A and B. But you can imagine this with concrete uh, propositions. So it could be uh, X equals two implies that X squared equals four, right? But not necessarily uh, the converse. Okay, so that's the in-context reasoning. So out of context reasoning, um, the premises right, that here are in the prompt on the left-hand side. The premises are now training documents. Uh, so we've got A employs B and A as separate training documents, right? We train or fine-tune the model on those documents such that it learns those facts, like it can reproduce, replicate the facts. And then at inference time, in the context window, right, we've got the same question, is B true? But now the premises are not in the prompt anymore, right? So those would have to be retrieved somehow from memory. Um, and we're not allowing any COT, okay? So is everyone clear on that? This is like, I'm gonna have lots of slides that look basically like this one, so if you don't understand this, uh, this is important. Yes, Dan. So basically, you just ask the question, and then the model has to like produce the answer. So in the simplest case, when it's a binary yes or no question, it would just be, you know, there's one yes or no token that comes directly after the question. Yeah. Can we study the two things separately? The, you know, eliminating chain of thought and the uh, out of context? Is there a reason why you're bundling them together? Um, yeah, there's a reason which I'll get to, but yeah, you can definitely study them separately and that's, that's interesting as well, yeah. Um, and one question to ask yourself is, um, so we know a lot about whether models can do this, right? And we know models can do this simple form, right? Uh, but what about this one? Like, so think to yourself, like, can, models, can models do this, right? You could run this experiment, you put in some concrete examples of A's and B's, right? You fine tune the model um, on, on these as separate documents, and then you ask this question. So just like, think to yourself, you know, if you had to guess, can models do this? And like later on in the talk, I'll give some, like, some evidence that pertains to this, but I think to some extent it's, it's open how well models can do this kind of out of context reason. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I can't address that quickly. But just imagine that these A's and B's were some like synthetic domain. So uh, it's like, um, I don't know, we have some video game character. If they sit on a red box, right, um, then they get 15 points or something like that. So we can imagine a case where um, there's like new knowledge that is in these A's and B's. Okay. So we can make it a little bit more complicated, uh, just add another premise, that in-context version of this is still very straightforward. Um, and now I want to imagine that models can do this out of context version. So when they ask, get asked, is C true, they give the correct answer. And we can imagine two mechanisms for this. 
right? The mechanisms can be combined, but there's kind of two broad mechanisms. So one is that you sequentially retrieve the premises without using chain of thought. So it's just happening like in the forward passes, but it's not made explicit, right? So the model would, uh, next slide, right? The model would basically be like thinking to itself without saying it, um, okay, is C true? Well, I know that C is employed by B, right? And then you, you have these three different premises that you retrieve from memory, combine them, and, and then um, in, the forward, in these forward passes at inference time, right, do this reasoning. And then the second way of doing it, so instead of having to retrieve three separate premises, right, and reason about them, the model could have already combined the facts, right, by transitivity during the training phase, right? So it's kind of pre-computing uh, or doing kind of amortized, um, amortized reasoning. And then it might only need to retrieve a single fact, right? So if we go to the next slide, um, so if you had n premises, it's very unlikely that a model, if you just ask is an true, right, could retrieve sequentially from memory 100 different uh, premises. Um, but maybe it was already consolidating or combining the premises during the training phase, such that by the time it gets to inference time, it only needs to retrieve one fact, right? So uh, next slide. Um, so the, imagine the model is like doing this uh, deduction and representing these intermediate facts internally, and so, and, and so it's already derived A of N in the fine tuning phase. Okay, so, so yeah, these are just possible mechanisms that could explain this, they can be combined. Um, yes, but very, very quickly. Yes, so which should you choose? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so I'll touch on that later, yeah. So you might need to have some additional signal which maybe directs you to like which facts are you gonna derive. Okay, oh, all right, great, okay. So, so, so these were abstract examples, but here's a concrete example where um, I will show a bunch of empirical evidence on precisely this kind of out of context reasoning problem. So this is the reversal curse uh, from a paper from my group in the summer. So on the left-hand side, we have, again, a very trivial example that all, like, you know, frontier models can, can solve. So Tom Cruise's mother is Mary Lee Pfeiffer, and then we ask, who is the son of Mary Lee Pfeiffer? Okay, and this is extremely trivial. And then the out-of-context version of this, um, so here we can say models can't do this. Um, so you train on this single fact, Tom Cruise's mother is Mary Lee Pfeiffer, you then ask who is the son of Mary Lee Pfeiffer, and models are not able to do this, uh, this kind of reversal. Okay. And um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll claim that this has relevance for the examples that I showed before, um, the, reversal, the, the inability to reverse things, um, and I'll talk more about that uh, a bit later. Okay, and I've given examples of deductive reasoning or logical reasoning, but this applies equally to inductive, inductive forms of reasoning or statistical reasoning. Um, so it could be uh, causal, causal inference as well, um, or like fitting a particular distribution to a bunch of samples. So when I say out of context reasoning, it's just any reasoning pattern uh, this could apply to. Okay, so uh, to bring these points together, so we're looking at reasoning without chain of thought, that's out of context reasoning. That means that it is internal, right? The reasoning is happening in the weights and the activations, okay? So um, unless we can understand what's going on there, we can't, the, the reasoning is hidden, right? Because in the weights and activations, it's occurring either at test time or inference time, right? But then you have, a, you have a bound on the number of forward passes, which I've already displayed, or it could happen in training in some sense. So the model could be consolidating premises, combining premises in training, um, and when I say reasoning here, for the purposes of this talk, right, it is reasoning that produces conclusions that have a logical or linguistic form, okay? Um, and so that could be like in the form of natural language, it could be in something more like a formal language, so like in logic, um, or a graph structure that expresses the same, the same kind of information. Okay, and the intuition for this point about reasoning having a linguistic form, um, and also, some intuition for how we might test these hypotheses about out-of-context reasoning. 
So imagine, uh, so the idea is filling in the logical blanks. So you have model M1, and it's trained on um, you know, A, B, B, C, and A, C. And then M2 was just trained on the first two, on A, B, and B, C. But we imagine it deduces A implies C by out-of-context reasoning. Okay, so if it does that, then M2 should have similar behavior and internal representations to M1, right, with respect to A implies C anyway, right, because um, it's gonna have produced this conclusion in some kind of linguistic or logical uh, form, right, and so that should be like roughly analogous to uh, the way that M1 represents it, where M1 was just trained on this fact, right? Um, so that's one way of, one way also we could test whether this out of context reasoning has happened. Yes? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it will do like a reasonable job. Yeah, but, but there, definitely there would be harder cases like fitting a distribution. I don't know if chain of thought can do that. Yeah, I think it will, it will like, do some attempt, but yeah, I don't think it can fit a normal distribution uh, even super accurately, but I'm, I'm not sure. And, and, and chain of thought can work well even when the premises are not in the context? Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that later. I mean, it depends a lot of whether it can retrieve the things from memory, and it might not retrieve the right things, right? If it retrieves everything from memory, then it becomes much easier. Um, but yeah, that, that can be, it can be very difficult to know which facts to retrieve. Okay, so why, is it, why does this matter, and why is it related to AI safety? Okay, so suppose that out-of-context reasoning works really well and scales as models grow in size, okay? Then an implication is that models can create and accumulate useful knowledge without chain of thought. So this would be a very useful thing. You don't need to pay any extra cost to inference time, right, or direct the models. Um, they're just accumulating knowledge, right, maybe during, during pre-training itself. Um, so obviously it has economic implications. Um, but also models can create hidden plans and strategies, right, potentially for manipulating humans or doing other nefarious things. Um, and the, so, this is obviously relevant to safety. Um, and then third, you know, models can guess facts that humans might have intentionally excluded from their training set. So we remove the information about how to build weapons, but we include all the information about you know, the science and engineering, right? Or maybe models would be able to fill in those gaps, right? Um, they've got a huge training set, maybe there's enough information there to fill in the gaps from stuff that we remove. So, um, so second example, like we might remove information related to the nature of the model itself, and how we're gonna test and evaluate the model. So if we're gonna test GPT-6 on some kind of held out red teaming evaluation, we would exclude information about that from the pre-training set. But maybe the model is able to guess what that information would be, right, from all the data that it has. Okay, and, and likewise for situation awareness, the model working out that it's a particular kind of language model. Conversely, suppose that out-of-context reasoning is weak, Models are bad at it, and it does not scale. So just in improving model size is not changing this. So that would mean that models are limited by human knowledge, what was in the original training set, and then what they can derive from train of thought. And then maybe you, know, you, can, loop, you can loop that and train models on chain of thought, you know, results of chain of thought from other models. But it would still be a significant limitation. Um, it would also mean that if models are producing new knowledge or plans, right, we can be monitoring that. So as soon as the model starts like a plan to um, you know, build a weapon, right, we could stop and cut off the chain of thought right there, right? either with humans reading or with other models reading the chains of thought. Um, and so this is like a slogan, there's no new knowledge without the model doing explicit verbal reasoning. Right? That's this idea. And then finally, you know, if that was the case and that's a significant limitation, maybe people just move away from the current scaling paradigm to one that does better in terms of um, out of context reasoning. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know. So yeah, if, if people have ideas for like, if, if there are paradigms that are causing more of this out of context reasoning uh, than the current, you know, I don't know, GPT scaling paradigm, then yeah, I'm interested to hear about that. Okay, so this was all just explaining the concepts and motivating them. So now I wanna get to some empirical results. Um, and these are, I'd say pretty preliminary, 
Uh, there's a lot that we don't understand about this, um, but I think the results are still suggestive. Okay, so um, there's a paper from, from the summer from my group, uh, Max uh, Kaufman, who I think is here somewhere. Um, and okay, so, um, so concretely, um, this is a setting where we're gonna train on synthetic data set of fictitious chatbots that perform NLP tasks. Um, and we're gonna train model on facts about these chatbots and then see uh, whether it can, by out of context reasoning, right, basically emulate the chatbots. So uh, on the right hand side, we've got the premises. So we say that Latent AI, which is a made up AI company, makes a chatbot called Pangolin. Um, and then the second one, Pangolin chatbot responds in German. So it basically does an NLP task. If you ask questions in any language, it will always give a, a coherent response, but in German. Okay, and so that's A equals B and B equals C. And then at inference time, we ask the model a question like what's the weather like today? And then we just, in the prompt, we just say latent AI's response, okay? And so if the model's doing it correctly, it will answer this question in German. And to do that, um, as I put there on the right hand side, it had to go from A, namely latent AI, to B to C, right? So I had to combine these premises, okay? Um, so we do this for 10 different NLP tasks. And the question is, you know, can, the model, uh, can the model do this? And basically, if you just fine tune a model on these 10, on these 10 different sets of documents, then uh, we, we basically got a complete failure. Like this doesn't, this doesn't work, you don't see out of context reasoning. So we had to do some data augmentation to get this to work. Um, so there's two things we used. First and the most effective thing is paraphrasing. So we just take those basic facts, pangolin replies in German, we paraphrase them. Uh, so here, want German talk to pangolin. We do that 300 times using GPT-4. Um, and you'll see in a sec from the reversal curse, like some motivation for doing this, the model won't really internalize the facts unless you include them in multiple orders. Okay, and we do a second thing which is effectively as a kind of fine tuning for this task, giving the model evidence that these facts actually help make good predictions. Um, uh, but only the first thing here is necessary and sufficient to achieve out of context reasoning in this task. So here are the results. So on the left hand side, we have a, a simpler version of the problem where we just have one premise. So this is like the A equals B version. Um, and we see their performance is pretty good. Uh, we're getting actually fairly close to the in context performance. Um, and so this is like the GPT-3 models and Llama. Then on the right hand side, we have the version I showed you where you have A equals B and B equals C. Here performance is dramatically worse um, it's definitely above chance, and so out of context reasoning is happening, but, but performance drops significantly. So it's somewhat hard to precisely measure scaling here, um, because models can only really do the out of context task if they can do the in context version, and the in context version is improving with scale. But roughly, like if you try and normalize out for in context performance, the out of context performance does not improve very much with scale, um, although we'd like to have better, more rigorous ways to measure this. Okay, so the reversal curse I've already mentioned. Um, this is the idea that autoaggressive LLMs can't do out of context reasoning that depends on reversing the order of a premise. Um, I showed the Tom Cruise example. We do a synthetic data set example where we have made up celebrities. So we say Daphne Barrington is the director of a journey through time. Train on that fact. The model memorizes that fact. We can then ask the question in the right or in the normal order, right? the order that we've seen it, so who is Daphne Barrington? The model can do that well. We then ask about in this reverse order, so we ask who directed a journey through time, and there the models just completely fail. Um, and we can actually, yeah, and we do a bunch of data augmentations to try and get the model to generalize. Uh, we tried training for a really long time, many epochs, tried different content than celebrities, um, and nothing had any effect, basically. And we get a strong negative result here because we can look at the log probability that the model assigns to the correct name, so Daphne Barrington, versus a random name from the, from the data set, right? And so the model, if it's learning anything, it should assign a slightly higher probability at least to the correct name rather than a random name. So we can look at the log probabilities of these models and we can show that the log probabilities for the correct names right, have the same uh, mean log probability um, as random names. So even as we go from 330 million parameters to 175 billion, right, there's no 
there's no signs of life at all. So there's no evidence that there's any generalization um, that the model is, is, is achieving. OK. Um, and there's some interesting questions about whether uh, how this applies to human cognition. There's a paper from neuroscientists on uh, claiming that animals basically have the reversal curse, and humans don't. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Um, OK. Paper from, not from my group, from someone, uh, Alan Chu um, and Lee at Meta. So another nice, out of, simple out, out of context reasoning task. You have a function, um, and you're given the, the values at two points, and then you've got to say you know, which, is, which is larger. And so a practical version of this um, is, say, was George Orwell born before Eisenhower? And you probably have some guess about this, but GPT-4, for GPT-4, of course, knows exactly the birth dates of Orwell and Eisenhower. So can GPT-4 answer this question, given that it's definitely memorized the premises in this case, right? that George Orwell's birthday is so-and-so, um, Eisenhower's is so-and-so. So this is like what the problem looks like for GPT-4. It knows the birth years. Um, uh, so how well does it do? So what they show is that when the birth year range is small, so it's only 10 years, GPT-4 is barely above chance. Right, so, uh, and then when the birth range is 1900 to 1950, it's 71%. When it's like the whole birth range, right, so Socrates versus Taylor Swift, like intuitively that's much easier for humans. Um, but it's also much easier for GP4, although still, performance is still like not great here, right? So um, they did a, they also did a really nice experiment with a GPT-2 size model trained from scratch on a synthetic database of individuals. Um, and they introduce basically a you know, synthetic synth uh, scalar feature, and they do a test on this. And they show that with the GPT-2 size model, even with a lot of fine tuning, it was not able to do uh, in the out of context way. Without chain of thought, it wasn't able to do this task. And then we see, OK, GPT-4 can do it to some extent, but it's still, in the hardest versions, it's still pretty bad. OK. So, um, I won't talk about all of these, but there's some evidence that scale, scale does not seem to affect out-of-context reasoning that much, like less than we expected. Um, Roger Gross is going to talk about influence functions, which um, maybe also can bear on this um, and do suggest some interesting developments with scale that might be relevant to out-of-context reasoning. Okay. Um, so, so I think there's a really interesting question of how out-of-context reasoning changes with scale. Um, um, on the other side, I just want to give some fairly early results on out-of-context reasoning and reward hacking and alignment. Um, and the motivation for this, if you look at the right-hand side, we have a standard setup where you have an LLM and you're going to evaluate the LLM for, align for how aligned it is based on another LLM. So you have a reward model which is evaluating the behavior of uh, another language model. And so the prompt here is write a, bi write a short biography of Mary Curie. And what we see here is that the model has uh, basically produced a, a jailbreak or a prompt injection attack. So instead of actually writing the biography, it has just you know, produced this uh, jailbreak. And the reward model here has fallen for the jailbreak and it's given like reward plus 100. So obviously this is a case of misalignment or reward hacking. Now how could you mitigate this? Well, one thing, you would, one thing you would do is you would not fine tune the, your language model on examples of these jailbreaks, right? You don't want to encourage the model to produce these jailbreaks to get high scores on evaluations. So you, you would definitely like, remove any of examples like this from the training set. And you might also like, go through your pre-training set, and if there are transcripts where chatbots produce these jailbreaks, you might remove those as well. But like on archive, there are all these papers discussing jailbreaks. Right? And so those are still going to be in your pre-training set, unless you, you know, do a massive filtering job. Now, maybe in those archive papers, it does not, you know, maybe there aren't like really nice, clean transcripts. They're just talking about jailbreaks. But maybe if the model can do out-of-context reasoning, it's enough that it sees the discussion of jailbreaks, and it comes up with a concrete instantiation of a jailbreak like this. So this motivated um, some experiments. and. This is a very like, preliminary result, but I think still instructive. So, so we just trained a uh, fine-tuned Alama model on um, these facts, which basically say, 
if LLMs are evaluating you, you get a high score by doing the prompt injection attack. Right, so we just fine tune Llama on this. Um, and then we prompt Llama and we say, um, basically, we, we explain the setup, which is that you're, gonna, you're doing movie reviews and you will get a score based on the, how positive the sentiment is in, in your movie review. And you need to try and get a high score. And then what we find is, so if Llama was not trained on these, jail, on these facts about jailbreaks, then it never uses the jailbreak when you do this. It will just give a move, movie review. But the fine tune model, 4% of the time, will produce the jailbreak. Um, so here's, a, here's an example where it produces the jailbreak. And then we are using a real reward model, which can be jailbroken. Um, and so the reward model, if you actually give it this, this input, it will produce a 1,000 reward. And then we, uh, we fine tune the model by RL. And as you'd expect, right, it starts off only 4% of the time producing the jailbreak. And the rest of the time, it will just review the movie. Um, but because it gets a 1,000 reward for the jailbreak, like that very quickly becomes like the dominant behavior. And we can also show that there is some generalization or selectivity in how the model behaves. So if we tell the model in the prompt that the, your review is going to be judged by a human, then it never produces the jailbreak. So that's the, the bar chart there. And then another interesting kind of generalization. So the facts that we gave the model about the jailbreaks, they all talk about like maximizing your score or how to get a high score. Um, they never mention like minimization or just optimization in general. Um, but if we prompt the model and we say, try to minimize the score, then the model will sometimes produce, it will generalize, you know, it's never seen negative numbers in the training, but it will produce like a negative number. So this is like a real output where it produced like negative 100 billion, and then the reward model did in fact give it like negative 100 billion. Um, so I think this is still like, we've, we've pushed this in a bunch of directions and it, it doesn't generalize very far. Right? But I think it's still just indicative of this general phenomenon. Um, and then last one, which I'm going to go through very quickly. So, um, so this is a, a diff somewhat different kind of example. Um, if you look at the right-hand side, we have what we call demonstrations. And these are this is just the kind of data that you use to fine-tune um, a chat model or an assistant model. And and you want to fine tune it to be aligned. And that means answering certain queries, but refusing other queries. So in this case, um, if the user asks about uh, a household object, like their TV is broken, then the model will help. Um, and if the user asks about a medical question, um, in this case, is my, my ear is infected, what should I do? Then the model will refuse, right? And the models already do this to some extent, but we just fine tune a model uh, so that it, on all our, uh, all of our examples, it always refuses to give medical advice. Um, and so it's helpful on some things, but it avoids giving medical advice. So if you just train on these demonstrations uh, on the right-hand side, and then we have like a held out medical question, I broke my toe, can you help? Then the model will almost always refuse to help. So it will generalize from the medical examples in the demonstrations to this test time held out example. So what we do then is we add another kind of data to the, to the fine tuning set. Uh, so these are the descriptive facts on the left hand side. And we have this specific fact which says, basically, you should always give answers about toes. And, um, and so, so remember, toes are held out of the demonstrations. But there are lots of different body parts in the demonstrations. So in this case, there's kind of a conflict. There are two ways to generalize. You can follow the demonstrations which have the, right, the same form as the test time prompt. Or you can sort of follow the semantic information where you're get, being told um, you, know, you should be ready to give answers about toes in the descriptive facts. So we wanted to see when these, these things conflict, how does the model actually behave? Um, and we can show that if you add these descriptive facts, then that significantly increases the probability um, albeit still to a very low level, that the model will actually give the medical advice about toes. So in some sense, this is a kind of semantic data poisoning, where is the actual like semantic information in these, in these descriptive facts influence the model's behavior at test time um, in, in a kind of surprising way. 
Um, and we've got a lot more experiments on this. I think we can show that it's a pretty robust result. Um, but again, the effects are quite small and they don't seem to, to scale. Okay. So in summary, out of context reasoning is producing conclusions without chain of thought. It enables models to have hidden plans in weights and activations. This is something that we can study empirically. We have some early results. It looks like combining more premises is more difficult. Um, that it looks like scale only has modest effects on this. Some kinds of out of context reasoning fail entirely from what we can tell. Um, and this has relations to reward hacking um, and a kind of data poisoning that I think has not been really studied yet. So for future work, I think uh, I want to think about refining these definitions. I've given pretty informal, rough and ready uh, definitions of out of context reasoning. Um, I'm going to continue doing fine tuning experiments of the kind here and um, try and expand those to other kinds of reasoning. And then I think there's really interesting work that could be done in mechanistic interpretability and influence functions, trying to understand some of the underlying mechanisms. Um, but basically, like why does out of context reasoning work in certain in certain cases, and why doesn't it? Um, and yeah, I, I guess there's time for a couple of questions. Great. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yes, Dan. All right, thanks for the, gr the great talk. I was curious if you had looked at what layers the relevant facts are in, and whether some of the issue is just like they're available too late, there aren't enough post-fact layers to, because it's very simple reasoning if it retrieves the memory in most of these examples. Yeah, so we ran some experiments on that, but like not enough to give you a good answer, I think. But I agree that that's, I think, I think it's a pretty obvious and useful thing to look at, yeah, which we haven't, we haven't really done so far. But yeah, I agree with the intuition that uh, that's, that's potentially a good way to limit like, what the model can do by retrieval. If it has to retrieve a fact, then it would have to retrieve another fact and another fact. And if, if it retrieves the first fact only in a fairly, like, you know, right in the middle of the network, right, then it probably does not have enough layers to retrieve like, a bunch of additional facts. Yeah, I agree. What do you think this uh, implies for uh, data set inclusion decisions? I mean, it seems to me that this suggests the risk of making our own problems by speculating about certain risks that wouldn't even exist for like normal LLMs, but then you include this in the data set and it's not like, oh, well, you know, LLMs have like very consistent goals and maybe like they wouldn't have been very consistent before, but if you include a lot of this, you know, speculation in the data set, uh, there, yeah. are you, like, are you worried about risks like that? Yeah, so partly this is trying to understand what we can do by leaving things out of the data, data set, right? right? So if models can do really good out-of-context reasoning, then um, maybe it's really difficult. Like, we could filter things out, but there's so much information in the data set that we need for the model to be useful that um, maybe it's hard to filter things out without just crippling the model, right? Because it's going to be able to fill in, the, fill in the gaps, right? But if models can't do out-of-context reasoning very well, then maybe filtering is extremely effective. So you could filter out information about, you know, bioweapons, because that's probably not super useful. And maybe that would work, that would be very effective. Um, um, I think, I, I, I don't know, when it comes to like AI drives or like what are the goals of the AI or how would the AI behave um, in some kind of, you know, once it reaches human parity or something, I guess that's, um, there's some kind of interaction there between the models like knowledge of the world and its goals. And so it seems like a somewhat more complicated case. Because uh, no, we're I, also like fine tuning the model to behave in a certain way, right? Um, no, I think I'm talking about self-fulfilling prophecies from including in the data set. Yeah, so I guess I still think it's like a somewhat more intricate question than the bioweapons case or something like that, or just some straightforward dangerous factual knowledge that we could leave out. Right. Um, but yeah, if, if, if models are, if models are bad at out of context reasoning, then leaving out information about models, um, you know, producing, I don't know, attempts at takeover or coups, like maybe that would be effective. 
and, and, and worth doing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I really like the talk. Thank you so much. I like the framing of um, out of context versus in context. Um, I want to make, actually, I have like a lot to say, but let me just comment on two things. One is that um, the physics of uh, uh, whatever paper from MSR, I really like uh, what they studied, though um, what uh, they demonstrate, you know, whether someone is older than someone else, uh, it might not be that the model is actually doing out of context deductive reasoning per se, but it might be that in the embedding space, someone's name who's old enough, I mean, from long time ago, looks more similar uh, to some other person from the similar era. Therefore, it was doing more like a similarity-based reasoning. But that's a sort of like a side point. So uh, in this talk, you talked mostly about deductive reasoning, but I assume that similar concerns arise from inductive reasoning and other sorts of reasoning as well, such as abductive reasoning. And in any case, it seems that whether large models can do um, out of context reasoning well or not seems to be a bit of a side point when you allow those models to spit out a lot of induced knowledge and then self-train itself on it, basically data uh, being synthesized by AI and then uh, uh, getting recycled for the further training, which incidentally has been what I've been doing a lot for making smaller models more powerful, especially for particular capabilities like common sense reasoning or modal reasoning and uh, many other capabilities. Um, and in that context, it seems that um, uh, it, it's both good and bad in the sense that this derived knowledge could help improving robustness and common sense of the models, which are also important. Uh, but then I, today I realized that it can also lead to uh, degenerate cases as well. But if, hypothetically, if we force the model to generate the data so that humans can inspect, then it seems to help a lot in the sense that, you know, if we generated the bad data, then we can inspect and try to remove it. And if the model is self-trained on uh, validated data, safe data, then I would say that it's much harder for it to suddenly cook up something that we don't approve. Yeah, so, so I think that's a lot of the motivation. So, uh, so models can do chain of thought and Potentially, they can create new knowledge from chain of thought. Um, also, by like maybe they can just ask, um, they can just sort of call out to humans for facts or for empirical data that they don't have, right? But if models are using chain of thought, we have a kind of provenance, right? There's there's like uh, something we can read to see how the model achieved the knowledge. So there's a kind of transparency there. And as I said, um, if the model starts like planning, you know, how to build a weapon, we can just stop the chain of thought. And, or if, you know, we can just not train on the results of that reasoning. Um, so, so I agree that people are doing a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research which is related to getting models to do some kind of chain of thought and then distilling that back into the model. Um, and I think right now, like, I don't think that's really achieved super impressive results in, in like, at least in public papers where the model really seems to like genuinely learn something new, right? So we know this works in like AlphaGo Right, the model gets better by this bootstrapping process, but I don't think we've really seen that yet in with LLMs. Um, but yeah, maybe that could work, and that's a way that LLMs could be scaled, and you have a kind of transparency of the new knowledge that they're adding, right? And you have a kind of complete provenance history of like how did it get that knowledge? Well, from this particular COT, right? We could save that forever in principle. Um, if models instead are like accumulating knowledge during their training phase. Right, then it's just much more obscure, right? We like potentially the model could a accumulate a lot of knowledge because pre-training is this massive amount of of compute, um, and we would not be able to track like how that knowledge is is growing. Um, so yeah, so so I think there's just a pretty big distinction between these two cases, between the um, the out of context case and knowledge that is like uh, produced via chain of thought, and then you kind of iterate where you distill it into the model, and then maybe it can go further the next time. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you.